Most of the time, when we go to the field to sample, we do things by effort, okay? Which is to say, I know that if I stay away from home for more than about four weeks, I won't have a home when I want to go back. Which is to say, my permission from my wife is a month. Or, maybe you say, I'm going to sample for five days at each site and then move. Or maybe you say, I'm going to accumulate 500 trap nights at each site. Or, like I just said, each camp lasted about a month. So notice that we are staying at a site or we are sampling for a set amount of effort. Okay? And that's a, that's a very artificial thing to do. Let me illustrate this for you. I'm going to take you to sample in this forest, okay? Notice that there's a nice, beautiful trail. The trees are spaced out very beautifully. There's not a lot of underbrush. You can set your traps or your nets or you can do your observations, whatever you need, very easily, okay? This is a very pleasant place to spend time. And I go out and I work for a certain amount of time. I'm accumulating my species. And when I get to my effort-based cutoff, that's the number of species that I've detected. Okay? <coughs> now these are easy places to spend time. Okay, we could sample this area. Looks like where you could take your family and have a picnic. Or I could take you to this place. Okay, and you guys have been to some of these places, right? <laughs> there are places where you would take your family to have a picnic, and there were places where you do not want to go at all. You know, my, f my favorite, uh, unfavorite habitat is mangroves. Right? I hate mangroves. <laughs> I truly hate mangroves. Kate loves mangroves because she loves crocodiles. But if you had to spend the rest of your life in one habitat. And she's in over plenty of others. Wow. <laughs> Take that over the city, capital cities. <laughs> okay. So forget about comfort. Sampling efficiency. Right? Where are you going to be more efficient? Okay? And remember, I work with birds. So you're trying to see a bird perched on the top of this tree versus trying to see a bird perched on the top of this tree. A little bit different. So in that first example, we had our amount of effort. But in our second example, our inventory may be quite different just because it's harder. And so even though this site has many more species than this site, it's just easier to sample and detect, even access, the first site. And so our, you know, if we sample for a long time, our true number of species here is whatever that number is. But if we sample the same amount of time, notice that in the end, the second site is more diverse. But if we cut off based on effort, we get the opposite picture. Okay, this is a made up example, but it's very true, okay? I've done this results-based sampling in local habitat matrices in Mexico. And you know, there are things, there's a, a habitat type called thorn forest. And you can't walk more than a couple meters into the thorn forest before you're just basically immobilized by these trees, okay? Or any bamboo forest, if you've worked in bamboo, it's miserable. So the idea of results-based sampling is that you continue your sampling until your results achieve a certain level of precision, not until you fit some effort-based criterion. Okay, not until you accumulate 500 net nights or net days, but rather until your inventory gets up to some level of precision. And so, 
you can develop what we, in that paper, we termed sp stopping rules. And so, you remember we talked about S observed, the number of species known to be at a site, and we talked about S expected, the number of species estimated to be at the site. Okay? And you take the ratio of that and you call that completeness, which we use the, the, the abbreviation C. And so we can say something like we want to have observed at least 95% of the species that are projected or predicted to be at that site. And then we want to maybe add another criterion, like let's go five days without adding a species to the inventory. You know, or you could say you know, uh, a day or five days without adding more than 10 species, whatever. It depends on your organism. But you can set up stopping rules that kind of fit the dimensions of the accumulation curves that fit your group. Now, I am perfectly, perfectly conscious of the fact that this may be impossible. You know, the plane is coming back for me on the first of the month. I can't leave before then, right? But this is, this is an effort, this is an idea that really can improve inventories. So if you look back at these uh, plots from that paper that we developed, here's S observed. This is the truth, by the way, but that's not the point. The point is, let's take this estimator, it comes down. So initially my estimates are very high. So here, C is going to be about 0.6. Right? I've seen this many species, and I'm, my estimator says I've got this many more to discover. <clears throat> by, I, by the time I get here, maybe it's 90, 92% because I'm comparing this number to this number. And by the time I get out here, I'm somewhere around 100%. Now, if, if I've got 20 days, then my stopping rule could be 100% and no new species added. That's very stringent. That might work for, you know, wild palms in, in Benin, where you have eight species. It might not work for birds in Benin, and it certainly wouldn't work for beetles. Okay? Um, but you can invent a stopping rule that works for your group. I'm going <coughs> to move on to this. So here's the idea. Let's imagine we have different stopping rules. Let's imagine we have different kinds of stopping rules. And let's imagine I just need a certain amount of time to detect each species. So this is a simple world, okay? So for this site that re in reality has 120 species, maybe I need 12 hours to detect that. I, I'm, I shouldn't say hours because I'll get it wrong. But I, I need a certain number of hours to de detect those 100 spe 120 species, and I need a much lower number, in fact, one-sixth of that time to get these 20 species. But if I go in and I say I'm going to do a set amount of time per, um, per site, maybe seven hours each, then I'm undersampling this site and oversampling this site. Okay, which is to say the accumulation for this site is still going up and the accumulation curve for this site leveled off a long time ago. And these two sites are done okay. If I sample the longest time, which is to say I know I need at least 12 hours to sample any of the sites in this region, then I've wasted time at three of my sites. But if I have the possibility of putting 12 hours to this site and two hours to this site and seven and seven, then I've optimized the use of my time. Yes, ma'am. Um, hold on, hold on, hold on. When you're choosing the, the times for these sites, how long you're going to spend at each site. Are you, do you take into the, count the ecology of the site? Is that basically? 
No, that's, that's why I call this result space sampling. Mm -hmm. I don't choose amounts of time at all. What I do is, as my inventory proceeds, I am guessing at how done I am. And so I'm essentially watching that accumulation curve come up, and maybe every day or every hour, I'm doing a completeness analysis. Mm -hmm. And when that completeness analysis gets up to my criterion, and any other criteria that I might have imposed, I stop. Okay. okay? So I don't have to guess in advance about where it will be easy and where it will be hard. Okay. Yeah, that, that pretty much works very well if you are doing, if you are progressing on a specimen by specimen basis, as in, in bird watching, which is correct. So you get one new specimen which might, might or, not, or might not be a not recorded species. However, uh, in some cases you will have to go work with actual samples in which you have to count what is in one sample <coughs> and, then take, and then decide whether to take a next sample or not. That's true. <coughs> in that case, um, the problem is that the accumulation curve will be affected by the <coughs> order in which the new samples are taken. Right. So you have to somehow pull. However, this looks quite quite efficient for 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 the specimen by specimen population. And you could even use this <coughs> for post processing, which yeah, is to cool. say, you know, if you go out and take soil samples, mm -hmm. and then you're going to invest all that time with Berlazy funnels and things like that, or with you know sitting down at a microscope to to identify the taxa that are present. You decide when to stop. Yeah, maybe you get 50 samples from each site but you only analyze until you've met a resu results-based criterion. That's what we do, that we stop <coughs> things so we can yeah. get an average. Right, cool. right. So definitely, definitely, and we haven't mentioned this to everybody, but when you do these, these, um, these calculations, for example, using the Chow indicator, the order does matter. And so we'll do a, a bootstrap, a subsample, and we will randomize the order. So the accumulation curve becomes kind of a, a suite of accumulation curves that get you out of what would essentially be temporal <coughs> autocorrelation. So in bird work, that's very common. You know, for example, in March, if I go to the Cameroon Mountains, I don't know any of the bird songs there. And so I may spend three days walking around the forest and not detect a species. But then the species pops up in front of me and sings. And I then learn that song, and now I'm thinking, okay, if I hear that song, that is that species. And so I get my, my occurrence matrix looks like a string of zeros before I knew the song and a string of ones after I knew the song. Or even worse, sometimes I realize, okay, there's a nest of that species on that branch. <coughs> and so all the days before I discover that nest, I never see the species. And all the days after I, I discover that nest, I just look up there, there's the bird, done. So you get temporal autocorrelations in your data. And so a randomization procedure is very important to breaking up that, that uh, autocorrelation. Okay?